Hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm Catherine Hollander, a research analyst focused on outreach at GiveWell. Um, and I'll be talking about our incubation grants program today. Uh, I think when EA Global reached out about uh, the possibility of, of providing a talk about GiveWell's work here, um, when I learned that the theme was stay curious, our incubation grants program felt like the perfect thing to talk about since this is really work that is intended to expand uh, the horizons that uh, we're considering at GiveWell. So uh, just briefly, I'm gonna talk about what GiveWell incubation grants are. Uh, they're a newer part of our work. Uh, the different types of incubation grants that we've made. Uh, some of our past incubation grants as sort of illustrative examples. Um, I'm not going to probably talk about all of the incubation grants that we've made, but um, would be glad to take questions about um, other grants if you're aware of them or curious to hear about other possible areas that we've supported uh, during the Q&A, and I'm hoping we can leave about 10 minutes for that. Um, and then just briefly kind of touch on where incubation grants fit into GiveWell's plans for the future. So uh, GiveWell, uh, as many of you might know, is a nonprofit that's dedicated to finding and recommending outstanding giving opportunities. And so we publish a short list of top charities every year that represent some of the opportunities that we think are extremely evidence-backed, cost-effective, transparent, and in need of additional funding. And we think that these are great opportunities for um, many donors who are interested in using our, our research. Incubation grants are something that we started to think about uh, a few years ago. Uh, we, Gibble was founded in 2007, so we're, we're a little over 10 years old now. And around 2014, we were starting to think like, hey, we've been recommending um, pretty similar types of programs for a while now. Um, our top charities list hadn't changed a lot. It was looking like cash transfers, um, insecticide treated nets to prevent malaria, and deworming pills um, continued to be kind of the things that were standing out among our criteria. And we were continuing to look for other things that, that met those criteria, but, but really not finding a lot that was, that was new. Um, and so, you know, we started to think like, are there things that we could be doing to help develop the pipeline of potential future top charities? And one thought that we had was, you know, as a, as a recommender and as a funder, we're really stepping in at a fairly late stage in charities' life cycles. You know, we're, we're looking for things that are extremely strongly evidence-backed, which means that by the time that they're getting to GiveWell's recommendation, someone has probably already funded them such that they could develop that track record that we need to look at to see to make our recommendation. Um, someone has funded the program research that we rely on to say like a particular program is very evidence-backed and we're interested in finding charities that support that program. And so the incubation grants program is us at GiveWell stepping in as that earlier stage funder and trying to um, specifically develop the types of charities and the types of program research that we think will ultimately make it to our top charities list where we can recommend them to a large number of donors and direct a significant amount of funding uh, to support their work. And so uh, this is you know, the kind of goals of our, of our incubation grants program, developing the pipeline of, of future top charities and, and also improving our understanding of our current top charities since you know, particularly as GiveWell has grown, we're, we're directing a significant amount of funding to the groups that we recommend. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we uh, answer questions that we have about them. And, and incubation grants is one, one way that we can do that. And then finally, um, I mentioned us stepping in as a funder, us making grants. Um, the funding that we are providing for the incubation grants program comes from Good Ventures. Uh, which is a large foundation that we work closely with. Um, you might be familiar with them if you're familiar with the Open Philanthropy Project. Uh, they were started by Dustin Moskovitz, who's one of the co-founders of Facebook and Asana, and his wife, Carrie Tuna, and they're significant supporters of GiveWell's top charity program as well. And right now, they are the, the sole funder of GiveWell's incubation grants work. So we're not recommending incubation grants to the donors who use our research. Uh, we are instead hoping that incubation grants builds the list of things that we are ultimately publishing for the public and recommending to all donors. So I, I briefly touched on a few of the different types of incubation grants. Um, we're, we're primarily thinking of our incubation grants program in three different buckets. Um, the first is work to seed potential top charities. Um, so this is perhaps fairly straightforward. We're looking at organizations at an early stage of development that 
would not meet our current top charity criteria. They don't yet have the kind of track record that we'd like to see to point to them and say, you know, we think that there is a very strong case for impact that we can make to donors, but that we think have the potential with additional funding and scale to become charities that we would recommend to donors. So um, there are a few different uh, grants that we've made in this space. Um, one is to a group called Charity Science Health, um, which came out of the EA movement, so some of you here might be familiar with it. Um, they're providing uh, SMS reminders for routine immunizations in India, um, but they're a very new organization, and so not one that has the kind of um, record that we'd want to see before we, we recommend them as a top charity, but, but something that we're interested in following as they grow and scale. Um, the second type of incubation grant is work to support monitoring. So uh, monitoring is really, really important for GiveWell. We're looking at charities where, where we want to really feel that we can demonstrate that they are having an impact. And so we want to see very good information from those charities that indicates that they are successfully reaching people with their programs, that you know, the people who are being reached with the programs are the people that they're intending to reach, and that we're kind of following any, any longer term uh, impacts that we might be interested to see. And so um, you know, one example of this type of grant that we made was for work to uh, identify cataract surgery organizations where we might be able to help them implement monitoring since uh, Previously, we, we were interested in the intervention of providing cataract surgeries to um, improve visual acuity due to cataracts, but we hadn't found an organization that met our um, bar for having monitoring that was demonstrating uh, who they were reaching with their surgeries, uh, how much those surgeries were improving their vision, and also just sort of what the counterfactual story is, whether those surgeries would have otherwise happened uh, in the absence of that charity's work. So those were the types of monitoring questions that we hadn't answered, and a type of incubation grant that we made was to support work to identify and build um, with a charity a monitoring system that would help us answer those questions. Um, that project is, is actually paused right now, and I'm happy to get more into that during the Q&A, but that's sort of an, an illustrative example of that type of incubation grant work. Um, and then the third type of incubation grant is to support program research. So, uh, GiveWell's research process is sort of divided into two different steps. Um, the first step for us is generally doing a survey of the academic research, the independent research that's been conducted um, on a particular program to help people. So um, this is not research that's generally done by charities themselves. Um, it's often done by academics. And, and that's our first step uh, in our process is looking at the academic research to see which programs we think might be the most cost-effective and evidence-backed such that we would be interested in finding a charity rec uh, that's working on that. And, and the reason we start there is just because well, there's two reasons. Um, one is that charities don't often themselves do this type of research. Um, running randomized control trials, for example, is, is quite expensive and, and not necessarily um, the sort of value added that most charities have. And then the second is that um, some of the biggest drivers in differences in program effectiveness and cost effectiveness is just which program a charity is implementing. So you know whether you're delivering insecticide treated nets or um, performing surgeries, that in and of itself will be a big driver in differences among charities' cost effectiveness. Um, perhaps more so than you know looking at two charities that are that are doing the same program. So we're we're interested in kind of that as a first step. And so uh, a type of incubation grant that we're excited to make is one that looks at a promising. Uh, area of academic research, but maybe there's only been one study that's done, or um, we have open questions, and funding further program research to, to support our understanding of, of that area. Um, so just a few examples of um, past incubation grants that we've made. Um, the first is a group called New Incentives, and I believe they were our first incubation grant recipient, if not first, second. So, um, back when I mentioned that we were starting this program in 2014, um, or around then, we, we made our first incubation grant to new incentives uh, in January 2014, I believe. And the program that they were implementing at the time that we were quite interested in was a conditional cash transfer program that was intended to incentivize pregnant HIV positive women to deliver in a health facility, to deliver their child in a health facility um, in order to prevent the transmission uh, of HIV from the mother to the child. Uh, and this looked to us like a promising uh, program, 
but it wasn't one, this, you know, this organization was brand new. We, we just didn't feel like we had enough information to say, like, we really feel solid about the case for this charity such that we would recommend it as a top charity. But we thought, um, you know, this seems like something that we would be interested to learn more about and seems like it could become something that we'd recommend. And so we made our first grant uh, to new incentives back in 2014. Um, in 2015, they ended up realizing that they weren't reaching enough um, HIV positive women with their program such that they decided to expand the program to just be to uh, incentivize um, pregnant women to deliver in health facilities. So they sort of shifted a bit there. Um, and then we spent the next year looking into the um, impact, the research that we could find on facility delivery on neonatal mortality. So does delivering a baby in a health clinic um, mean that it has better you know, neonatal mortality outcomes? And what we found at the end of 2016 was that we didn't think there was sufficient evidence to convince us that that was a program that we should recommend. Uh, but through this whole time, we had been engaging with new incentives, and we felt really positively about them as an organization. So we decided to um, make another grant to them to support a shift that they were making into providing conditional cash transfers to incentivize routine immunization. So they've kind of gone through a few different iterations through our incubation grants program. And what we're planning to do with them now is to um, run a randomized control trial, um, which I mentioned earlier as a type of evidence that we're particularly interested in. Um, it's a type of study where you divide people into uh, two halves, a, a control group and a treatment group. You randomly assign them, and then you look at the differences in, in outcomes uh, between those, those two groups. And so um, we're now working with an, another research partner that I'm gonna talk about momentarily called ID Insight to run a randomized control trial of their work and are now looking at them as a you know, potential top charity contender, something like in 2020, so a few years out. So it's kind of a you know, iterative process. I think this illustrates that. And, and the timeline might be quite long from making an initial incubation grant into joining the top charities list. But um, we've certainly learned a lot through the new incentives process and, and are continuing to follow them through, uh, through our incubation grants program. The second group that I wanted to talk about um, is another uh, incubation grant that we made very early on in the program. Uh, this was another kind of early 2014 incubation grant to a group called No Lean Season. Uh, we became interested in the program that No Lean Season is operating, uh, which is a seasonal migration program where they are providing small subsidies to uh, individuals in rural northern Bangladesh to enable them to temporarily seasonally migrate during the time of year when seasonal poverty is a, is a large issue and job opportunities are uh, harder to come by. So uh, the idea is that if you give people a small incentive that enables them to do something like buy a bus ticket to travel somewhere else where they can work, um, that can then have uh, beneficial uh, income and consumption benefits for their household. And so uh, in 2008, this this crossed our radar a little later, but the study was done in 2008, and it was a, a randomized control trial that was done by a Yale economist named Mushfik Mubarak. And he ran a small trial of this program, I think it was about 1,900 households that were involved with the initial trial, um, that saw significant uh, benefits for household income and consumption, as well as continued migration the year following the program in the absence of the incentive. And when we looked at that, we said, this seems like it has the potential to be one of the most you know, cost-effective programs that we've come across in a long time, and we're interested in this. But 1,900 households, um, this kind of one study that was done in this very particular area, uh, we're not sure we would want to recommend that quite yet as one of our top charities. So we made this initial incubation grant to uh, Evidence Action, which is an organization that runs the Deworm the World Initiative, which is one of GiveWell's longtime top charities uh, to scale this program. And Evidence Action had, had also been interested in this program, so we sort of came together at that moment and provided them funding to scale, scale this work. And in the subsequent years, they conducted a number of additional randomized control trials. Uh, they scaled from about that initial 1,900 households to I think around 100,000 households in 2017. And last year we decided we were at the point where we wanted to evaluate them sort of under our top charity, you know, traditional top charity criteria since we thought that they might now be at the point of having that track record that we'd want to see um, and that there might be sufficient evidence there where we'd say this is something we want to recommend to donors. 
And so um, we sort of put it through our normal process last year. Um, we spent a lot of time talking to them about how much funding they needed. We uh, built a cost effectiveness model of their program, which is a really important input for us. Uh, we looked at their monitoring and we did a site visit to their work in Bangladesh. And coming through that whole process, we ultimately decided at the end of 2017 that uh, in fact, Nolene Season did meet our top charity criteria, and so we added it to our list of the nine groups that we currently recommend. So this was our first incubation grant, you know, from the beginning to the top charity list uh, example that we have, and, and we're hopeful that this is, you know, something we'll see again in the future. So this, this is currently the first and only that has gone from the, that initial grant all the way through to meeting our criteria. And then the, the final um, example of a grant that I wanted to talk about is a group that we're working with called ID Insight. Uh, Buddy Shaw, who's the CEO of ID Insight, is giving a talk at EA Global tomorrow. I think it's at 3.30, and I would recommend it because um, they're doing really, really interesting work. And so um, I mentioned that one of the things that we're really interested in at GiveWell is, is this academic research, and that that's a really important kind of first step of our process. Um, what we found was that you know, academics aren't always incentivized to provide sort of decision relevant uh, information to folks that are implementing programs on the ground, right? Um, what we're often curious about is, you know, how will this program look when it scales? How will it look in another area? Um, and there's not always the academic incentive to conduct research that answers those questions. Um, ID Insight, we think, fills a really unique role in the uh, development space by specifically targeting providing that information. So they'll run sort of low cost RCTs, uh, randomized control trials, and try to provide decision relevant information to policymakers um, who are, or you know, people implementing programs to help them really decide where the most effective places are for them to work, how cost effective their programs are. And so this um, seemed really exciting to us. Uh, we have a lot of those questions that we're hoping to answer. And so we've partnered with them through our incubation grants program to work on a number of different projects with us where, where we're hopeful that they can help us um, you know, better understand the uh, spaces that we're interested in. And so I mentioned with new incentives, that first incubation grant recipient that I uh, had, uh, that they are running a randomized control trial. Um, ID Insight is working with us um, on running that randomized control trial to help give us that information. They're also working with us on a project to help better understand one of our current top charities, uh, the Against Malaria Foundation. So the Against Malaria Foundation is a group that's been on our list of top charities for a very long time. Um, I think they initially joined our list in 2011. And in 2016, we realized that we had some questions about the ways in which they were conducting their monitoring of their program. So the basic way that, that it works is that AMF, um, Against Malaria Foundation, goes back to households that have received insecticide-treated nets, and it checks every six months um, for the first few years after the uh, implementation, or sorry, it checks a percentage of households that receive the nets every six months after implementation to see whether they're hung and also what the state of the net is, since we believe that they degrade over time, like develop holes and become less effective. And, uh, I should say the nets are um, things that you hang over your bed. They're treated with insecticide and they both block mosquitoes from biting you and also kill them from the insecticide. So we think they're very good for preventing malaria. Um, and so uh, in 2016, we wrote, we wrote about some of the questions that we had about the way that they were conducting surveys in the Democratic Republic of Congo and in Malawi. And we partnered with ID Insight to help us both better understand their current procedures for conducting those surveys by um, having ID Insight observe them doing that on the ground, and then also to make recommendations for the Against Malaria Foundation to improve how they're conducting those surveys. And so this is um, this part of their, their work is really an example of a type of incubation grant that's geared toward improving our current list of top charities rather than sort of building a new organization to join it, but we think it's really important to, to have this work as well since we're um, you know, directing significant funding to the organizations that we recommend in the tens of millions of dollar range. Um, and then the final project with ID Insight that I wanted to call out um, is another like pretty different type of work than the type of work I mentioned before, um, which is that you know, I mentioned cost effectiveness is a really important factor for GiveWell in coming up with our list of recommendations at the end of the year. We're looking for things that you know, we can make a strong case are, are extremely cost effective. And um, where this gets particularly challenging is that 
a lot of the different programs uh, that we're interested in and that exist in the world have different outcomes. So I mentioned, you know, cash transfers, deworming, and the distribution of insecticide-treated nets as uh, some of the programs that were on our list for a long time. We think the benefits of those programs are very different. So, you know, distributing insecticide-treated nets to prevent malaria, um, we think reduces child mortality from malaria. Uh, distributing deworming pills, we think, has the potential for uh, increasing the incomes of children who receive deworming pills later in life. Those are really different outcomes. And so when you're trying to think, like, which of those two is more cost effective, you have to come up with some sort of comparison between the two that you can make. And so the way that we do this right now is that we have staff members who work on Givol's research team, informed by, you know, everything from the uh, their own philosophical values to, you know, the World Health Organization's uh, assessments of the different um, burdens of different diseases and, you know, other information that we have to make those trade-offs. But the piece of information that we think we are most lacking to make those trade-offs is how the recipients of the interventions of our top charities would, would make those trade-offs, how they would decide how much do I value, you know, increasing income versus improving health. Um, we, we have done uh, reviews of the, the literature to see if we can find information to inform that, but, but we've generally concluded that that information um, doesn't really exist and hasn't, hasn't been collected. A lot of the research that's done on how those trade-offs get made um, has been done in rich countries rather than in the poorest parts of the world where uh, Givel's top charities tend to operate. And so um, the kind of final project I wanted to mention that we're working on with ID Insight is a project to survey the beneficiaries of our top charities to ask them and, and try to better understand how they would make those trade-offs to inform our cost-effectiveness model. So, you know, this would be something that, again, I think would fall into the category of improving our current recommendations and strengthening, you know, the information that we can provide to donors who are interested in supporting these organizations. So um, those are a few of the incubation grants we've made. Um, it's, this piece of our work has been ramping up uh, in the last few years, so uh, there's quite a few that I didn't mention, but I'm happy to kind of talk about in the Q&A. Um, but just kind of wanted to close with, with a quick thought on, on some of our, our plans for the future. You know, especially for this audience, um, wanted to convey that, you know, GiveWell is moving toward, you know, we've been around for 11 years, we're moving toward being open to some of the sort of riskier ideas and harder to prove cases for impact than I think we have historically. And incubation grants plays a role there in giving us the ability to try to answer some of those, some of the questions that maybe have been challenging for us uh, in recommending things in certain spaces um, in the past. And so, you know, one example of sort of the, the riskier, harder to prove um, types of areas that we're, we're interested in now that in the past I think we've largely said this is outside of our domain, uh, is work in policy advocacy interventions where, um, you know, I think we, we're interested in finding things that might be significantly more cost effective than our current group of nine top charities focused on global health and development. And one of our best guesses for where we might find that is interventions that are targeted toward getting policies to pass that might affect, you know, many, many people for a long amount of time, that that might be a really cost effective thing for us to do. And so I think we'd be interested in supporting research through incubation grants that will help us better understand the causal impact of policy advocacy intervention, since I think you know, one of the biggest challenges there is you're not just going to have a randomized control trial of a you know, piece of, like a, the ability to pass a policy. Um, it's going to be a little harder to tell that story. And so we want to um, support things that will help us you know, potentially consider those types of areas in the future. Um, but this comes with the second bullet point, which is that, you know, we're still very interested in maintaining our level of transparency. And what I mean by transparency is really being able to make a case publicly that is vetable by donors who are using our research for why we think that something meets our criteria and is very cost effective. We want to be able to, you know, point to our rationale. We want to be able to point to evidence and monitoring um, that really demonstrates why something has ended up on our list and why we are saying, you know, this is one of the best opportunities we're aware of that meets our criteria. And so, uh, you know, incubation grants work is, is a tool that we're using to help us do that, and particularly as we move towards some of these areas that maybe in the past have been harder for us to assess by our uh, traditional criteria. And so, um, you know, I think uh, we're, we're very excited about this work. Uh, just to give you kind of a, a scale of it, I think last year we made something like close to $10 million worth of incubation grants. Um, and so it's, it's a big part of our work. 
Um, it's not the only part of our work. We're still you know, looking for organizations that meet our traditional criteria, um, not through the incubation grants program, but, but we're, we're uh, optimistic about helping uh, move toward building that pipeline and bringing more organizations uh, into our consideration. So I'm gonna pause here for questions. I think we're running low on time. Um, I'm around for office hours at 4.30, I believe, and I'm also happy to follow up via email with anyone who uh, has questions after the talk, too. So thank you. Thanks so much. Really appreciated your talk. Um, unfortunately, we are a little brief on time for questions, but I'll ask you one or two. Sure. Um, I think the kind of obvious one is if you're a person who's interested in uh, doing program research or helping an organization with monitoring, where can you find um, you know, the outstanding questions that you'd like to see answered or find the organizations that you could tack on to? Yeah, so where, where would you work if you were yeah. interested in um, incubation? I mean, we have a list of all the organizations that we're currently supporting through incubation grants on our website, and we also have a list of priority programs that we've identified as promising areas, but we don't yet recommend charities that are working in, so that's kind of one signal of where there might be um, either opportunities to start organizations or, or talk to us about that. And then, you know, I think for thinking about where we might potentially make incubation grants in the future, the sort of core question that we have is, how likely is this to become a GiveWell top charity? And we actually, we publish forecasts along with our top, with our incubation grants, so you can kind of see like, okay, we think that this grant has a 30% chance of resulting in a top charity. And so we're trying to sort of come up with initial rough models, think about how likely something is to become a top charity, and then um, make our decisions about what to fund based on that. Cool. Like, yeah. That's great. And let's say someone decides that they're going to run with a project, and um, now they want to get GiveWell's attention and see if maybe they can get an incubation grant and grow into a recommended charity. How do they get on your radar? Yeah, I think just reaching out to us. Um, you can email me or, or email like the info at givewell.org. Um, I think we, we want to have kind of early conversations, um, you know, before anyone spends a ton of time developing something. If they're trying to get incubation right. grant funding, we definitely appreciate like the chance to kind of check in and talk about what our interests are and hear about what the potential program is. But yeah, I would say just emailing us is probably the, the best way to kind of begin that conversation. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Um, well, I think we're going to have to call oh, it there. But thank you so much. Yeah. Really appreciate it.